I would like to thank all of you for your forgiveness uh, since I did not show up last year at a time when I was scheduled. So I have an opportunity to do it differently this time. I think it might be, be helpful just to sketch in very quickly something about my own background and interests uh, since I think it does play a part in some of the developments in relation to the course. I was uh, a very confused uh, young man in the middle 40s. Uh, I graduated from college, which was accepted in medical school at the University of Chicago. Did not really have either the money or the motivation to undertake that particular uh, curriculum, although I was still very much tempted by it. I had about eight months in which I might earn some money and I therefore wandered over to the University of Chicago and uh, asked, uh, you know, do you have any jobs? Uh, the only job for which I seemed to be uh, qualified, I, that really isn't the term, but the only job that was available had to, had to do with uh, something called the Metallurgical Laboratory of the University. I didn't know what that was and only later recognized that that was the code name for the Atomic Research Development Program at the university. Some of you with uh, long memories may, may recall that the first chain reaction in the atomic age began under the football stadium on the campus of the university when Enrico Fermi started the pile and happily was able to stop it uh, and celebrate it with a bottle of Chianti. Uh, the reason for for talking, I think, about that at this point is that there are so many startling parallels and juxtapositions which become clear to one only over the course of time. This was, of course, during the war. I was uh, made a, a kind of junior administrative officer of the university because I wasn't qualified, but I was a warm body on the spot and was able to take care of a great deal of uh, expediting of shipments of plutonium, uranium, and things of that kind. I decided not to go to medical school after I had saved up a few hundred dollars. And I thought uh, there was a kind of commitment to seeing this through in a different historical context where the hope was that there would be a, uh, a, a way of perhaps facilitating the end of the Second World War where Western civilization might be hanging in the balance and we were not sure what was happening elsewhere. I stayed with that program until August of 1945. I was there a little, about a year and a half. And at that time, of course, we are all aware of the tragic events when the bomb was dropped. And uh, I felt, okay, I've done whatever it was that I was supposed to do, and I will resign, which I did. Now, if I'm not going to get a MD, I guess maybe I should get a PhD. I didn't know what a PhD was. I had never really known anyone who had gone through this particular kind of struggle and travail, so it was all totally uncharted area. My uh, family said, well, what does that do? You know, can you make a living with it? Do you, know, or do you hang it on the wall? Or, you know, what do you do if you get a PhD? Uh, but the extraordinary thing was that after the following month, after I resigned from this program, Carl Rogers appeared on the campus at the university uh, to found his counseling center and to teach as one of the basic tenets of his philosophy, unconditional positive regard. And I thought that's very interesting. Unconditional positive regard is obviously perfect love if you want to translate it uh, rather simply. Rogers didn't want to get involved in something that might sound uh, unpsychological. And uh, I started working with Carl, who made me first his teaching assistant and then a couple months later his research assistant. The reason that he hired me was because I was totally unqualified. Uh, I think this is very important. It really, really is. Uh, at 21, I didn't know anything. I had no graduate courses. Uh, and so I told Dr. Rogers, this is the beginning of my graduate work. I don't have a master's. He didn't pay any attention at all. He said, you know, when can you start? So. Uh, I became the first member, actually, of the student body at the university to work with Carl. Everyone else had been imported from Ohio State, which had been his last appointment. So the juxtaposition of uh, the atomic bomb and perfect love uh, within a month 
struck me as uh, rather dramatic. However, I was not burdened with uh, religious beliefs or concerns at that time, at least not on a conscious level. I had uh, grown up in a somewhat lukewarm wasp uh, family where my father or mother would say, it can't hurt you to go to church on Sunday, although I noticed that they didn't go themselves, so that uh, there was no impetus for doing this kind of thing. The intellectual atmosphere at the university was also quite different. Chicago at that time, when Hutchins was the chancellor and Mortimer Adler was doing the great books uh, with Hutchins and so forth, was a very different kind of atmosphere than was customarily found. Many people uh, describe the university as a Baptist university where atheist professors taught Jewish students Thomistic philosophy. <laughs> it's quite true. And uh, if I was confused before, I did not become less confused as the result of this exposure. So uh, somehow I went through a program and I got a PhD from Chicago in uh, March 49. I wasn't quite sure still what you did with it, but I thought perhaps after I have this degree, I will learn something because I really don't have time to learn anything now. I'm too busy getting this degree. And, uh, you know, after that, I'll, you know, hopefully have a breather and can learn something. So the, the, the only extremely firm conviction which I held in my mind was I will never be a university professor. Uh, it's the last thing I want to be. First of all, I don't have anything to profess. And I looked around and I saw a very eminent faculty, but uh, somehow there were little bits and pieces of information or knowledge. There was no sense of synthesis even though this was the goal of the particular program I was in, which was called uh, Psychology and Human Development, an attempt to try to integrate all of these different aspects of one's being. And I thought, you know, I, I'm not sure that the emperor has any clothes, but I'm only a naive graduate student, so I can't uh, challenge that, and maybe I'll find out later. I somehow got this degree, and uh, then there was the thought, you know, you really have to go to work, you know, you're no longer a student, you have to do something. And at that point, a friend of mine who was living at International House kept bugging me. And he said, uh, I think you should go to Michael Reese Hospital where Samuel Beck, the great expert on the Rorschach inkblot test, has a grant to do a study on schizophrenia. And I really think you should apply for that. I said, well, I don't know anything about the Rorschach. I, you know, I've never took any courses. I was trying to take the minimal number of courses in order to get through this in order to learn something later. So, uh, <laughs> nevertheless, I uh, did see Dr. Beck, who is extraordinarily gracious. And I said, Dr. Beck, I don't know why I'm here, but uh, I've never taken a course in the Rorschach. I don't know anything about it. It's terrific. Now, that, that's marvelous. <laughs> Yeah, you have not been contaminated by false teachings. Uh, so you will learn it freshly in, in this setting. And then he asked me to title my doctoral dissertation, which was a kind of early biofeedback uh, study with a primitive piece of equipment called the Darrell photopolygraph. Uh, those of you who know anything about psychophysiology will recognize that that was one of the very pioneering instruments in this area of trying to measure autonomic nervous system functioning, galvanic skin response, respiration, heart rate, and so forth. And you got long film records and things of that kind. And I thought it would be sort of interesting to find out if people who underwent Rogerian psychotherapy or client-centered psychotherapy had a greater frustration tolerance level after that experience than they had before. So I tested them in a kind of stress situation before and after. And Lo and behold, uh, the Holy Spirit obviously was there all the time, even though I didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit and would have been affronted, I'm sure, if anyone had mentioned it. <laughs> but uh, somehow it, it worked out and there were some uh, differences and uh, that was very exciting to Sam Beck and some other people who thought, that's terribly scientific. They thought it was scientific because they didn't understand it. Found that, well, this is sort of the way things go. So I found myself uh, working in a 
hotbed of uh, psychoanalysts at uh, I was terribly impressed, uh, so at least one of them had been analyzed by Freud. Uh, I didn't realize that that was like a six-week quickie thing where, you know, apparently one wandered in for an hour a week and Freud said, well, that's fine, you know, and I'll go away and do your thing. So uh, I didn't know anything about that, but I departed from the Rogerian philosophy sufficiently to become involved in something that was regarded as antithetical to this philosophy. Uh, when this research program was uh, completed, I then went to Washington, to the Washington School of Psychiatry, and I also did some consulting work with the government during that period. In the course of that, I was sent to the American University in Beirut, uh, Lebanon, for uh, the summer of 53. And again, I was sent because I was unqualified, but, uh, you know, they needed somebody, and you know, I didn't know anything about Middle Eastern affairs. It was rather extraordinary. It made a very profound impression on me. Uh, I'd never been out of the country, except for maybe Canada. Uh, and uh, here was the Holy Land, and I saw Israel uh, and Jordan and Jerusalem on both sides, and uh, Baghdad and Cairo and you know Athens and you know all those places. And something did happen to me, although I really wasn't quite sure what it was. In the back of my mind, there was a feeling, this is familiar somehow. But uh, we didn't talk about things like that, so uh, whatever that was, uh, was largely unverbalized. When I left Washington, I went to Hartford, Connecticut, where I was the director of the psychology department at the Institute of Living. and. Uh, person on the next floor below me was doing all kinds of fancy work with uh, monkeys and so forth. His name was Carl Prebram. And uh, uh, became interested in what Carl was, was doing and uh, all this was terribly fascinating. But this really can't be it. So I did receive an offer about that time from Cornell University Medical College in New York City, even though Cornell is in Ithaca, the medical school is in New York City, and a very famous neurologist named Harold G. Wolf, who was one of the founders of psychosomatic medicine, wanted to set up a very elaborate study program that had to do with cross-cultural studies and highest integrative functions in man under stress and all kinds of exciting things. Uh, so it was... Uh, honor, I thought, to be invited to join that particular program. And it was not until I got to Cornell that I suddenly realized somehow I'm in academia because somebody gave me an academic title. It was only an instructor, uh, but uh, at least I had my first uh, official appointment at that point. The following year, I was made an assistant professor, and just after that, a, an old friend of mine sort of wandered out of the woodworks as uh, people frequently do and uh, approached me and said that we can't find anyone at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, the, the medical center, to head up the pre-doctoral training program in clinical psychology. And they had a big list of famous people and so forth. Well, obviously these people weren't going to accept uh, this particular kind of job. And he said, uh, also, the, the search committee doesn't like most people. He said, but they don't know you. <laughs> so it seemed that uh, that was uh, keeping a low profile at times has been useful in my life. So, so I uh, thought, well, I really don't wish to leave Cornell and go way up to Washington Heights and take that long subway ride through Harlem and all those things, uh, you know, why? So I held out, and I thought the clever way of doing this and being gracious at the same time, I used to think I could figure things out, uh, that the, the, the way to, to do this is to simply say, well, this is obviously going to involve so many responsibilities that I couldn't possibly accept uh, an appointment like this unless I was made an associate professor. Well, this is now, you know, like a year, year and a half after uh, instructor and assistant professor, and uh, 
I thought that would take care of the matter, and it almost seemed to. But uh, uh, somehow, because they were desperate, the uh, doctor called the chairman of the psychiatry department, managed to persuade the dean, and uh, I suddenly got a letter offering me an appointment as an associate professor of medical psychology at Columbia uh, in the College of Physicians and Surgeons. So this was a little over two years after I had taken my first academic appointment with that resolution, I'll never end up being a professor. <laughs> so I, I felt morally obligated to go up there. When I went up, it was really a shambles. I don't know how many of you have worked in very large medical centers, but this particular one is regarded as, I believe, the largest private medical center in this country and uh, elsewhere. And there are thousands of people. We, it was an enormous, uh, complex maze. And I also found out that uh, there was divided authority and responsibility, and you had to report to the president of the hospital as well as the chairman of the department, but there was also a vice president in charge of professional affairs that you really had to see first, but you couldn't see him unless you checked through with business manager, and there were three business managers <laughs> because there were three institutions that were part of this, uh, not only the university, but the Presbyterian Hospital and the New York State Psychiatric Institute, which was all part of this complex. Uh, I found all this rather heady. I had not thought of myself as being an administrator, and I realized I simply didn't know how to cope, that uh, it was, you know, no matter what you did, you know, there were power struggles going on. I'd be quite happy to uh, injure their colleague's reputation or career if they could get another office. And to get a secretary, oh, that was fantastic. You know, you'd do anything for that, kill your grandmother, I guess. But uh, <laughs> it, it uh, was the most competitive and power-driven setting that I have ever been in, although I've seen a few. And uh, I tried to think, well, how am I going to deal with this? And I thought, well, I'm just going to try to deal with whatever I can deal with. But at the same time, I received a letter from the dean of the medical school who said, uh, we've accepted a large amount of money from the National Institute of Neurological Diseases, and uh, we have to have a research psychologist who is capable of evaluating infants and young children starting at the age of eight months and give them psychological tests, and a very specialized area. But we have to get this person right away, and of course you have to hire this person because you're in charge, and uh, otherwise we're gonna lose our grant. So I went to a neighboring hospital where I talked to a colleague who was much better informed than I, and uh, he said, well, if I find the right person, I will have him or her call you. About uh, 10 days later, the phone rang in my office, and the woman at the other end said, my name is Helen X, and I was told to tell you that I am the person you are looking for. I thought that's a rather strange way of uh, <laughs> introducing oneself, but indeed our mutual friend Harold had told her to say precisely that, you know. Uh, this is the person I'm referring to, so just tell him, you know, you're the person he's looking for. Obviously all these things have different meanings as one looks back on the whole uh, convoluted series of uh, events. Well, while I had done my graduate work rather early, Helen had not uh, wanted to do any graduate work. She was an English major as an undergraduate, had not taken psychology courses, and it was not until she was uh, in her early 40s that she suddenly decided she was going to be a psychologist. And Helen was a very determined person, so she uh, uh, indeed became a psychologist and received her doctorate the year before I hired her, uh, which is another interesting story. When I uh, interviewed Helen, I said, you know, this very funny project, which is called, you know, this collaborative study and so forth, uh, really doesn't have an office. I'm not quite sure who's in charge of it. I'm not quite sure what your duties would be, and I can't even guarantee the salary. I think most people at that point would have walked away. I, I think I would have, and perhaps most of you would have, but uh, I was trying to be honest since I didn't know what else to say. 
So obviously, since she had had a number of much better offers, she accepted this one. <laughs> it, it wasn't until some time later that I said to Helen, well, why, you know, why did you really take this job, you know, why? And she said, oh, there was that kind of, uh, I don't know what you call it, inner voice or something in the back of my mind that I don't pay much attention to, uh, which said, oh, there he is, he's the man you're supposed to help. <laughs> uh, I should hasten to emphasize, as, as I think all of you know, is that Helen was uh, a militant atheist. Mentioned God, she had a fit because she wanted to be a research psychologist and there was a, a sense of security in dealing with data you know, and you could make things into neat packages and so forth and somehow escape from all those ambiguities and terrible things that go on in the world. So she prided herself on being super objective. So that was the beginning of our relationship, which uh, was a very close as well as a uh, difficult relationship because temperamentally we're very different people, yet there was a sense of a kind of joint goal, that is, we both wanted to help each other. I think that was unequivocally clear. And we wanted to help the department, and we wanted to sort of make something out of this shambles. So it was really after six years of working rather intensively on all these projects that uh, I gave that speech, which keeps being quoted. I don't remember what I said, but it was something like that, you know, about there must be another way and uh, so forth, and that uh, seemed to uh, it was the most surprising moment, or one of the most surprising moments that I had encountered before that, because I expected Helen to be super critical. I said, you know, what is all this? You know, come off it, uh, you know. Uh, but that wasn't it at all. She said, of course, you're absolutely right. It was that feeling of almost instant joining that seemed to lead to these various events, uh, which Judy has described. The, one of the major ones, of course, is right here in Minnesota, which I think is interesting, isn't it? The Mayo Clinic in, in Minnesota, which I thought was a very major turning point in all of this. So very quickly and sketchily, that is how uh, I met Helen and how we started working together. Now, what time do we? And with reassurance, the next day we typed this thing up in extreme privacy. And this is how it began. I hope you won't mind. I think most of you know how, how the text begins. This is a course in miracles. It is a required course. Only the time you take it is voluntary. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. It means only that you can elect what you want to take at a given time. The course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. This course can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. I caught my breath. And I realized as we started doing this and we certainly seemed to me to be babes in the, in the woods. Where were all you people? Why weren't you <laughs> up at Columbia Presbyterian to give us support and uh, reinforcement? We didn't know anyone. Or we didn't feel free to look up people. We didn't really know what was happening. And uh, we had our extreme anxiety reactions. I certainly had mine. I realized that very shortly, as, as we were just going through the initial 50 points on miracles, that if this were true, then absolutely everything I had ever thought was, might be true, or everything that I had been trained to believe was not. And I thought, am I up to this? 
am I up to trying to make that kind of shift? You realize we had no idea if there were going to be three volumes or anything else. This is A Course in Miracles could have been, you know, a pamphlet. They <laughs> didn't tell us. They didn't say, well, there's going to be this very long textbook, and then after that there's going to be 365 lessons in the workbook, and then later a uh, teacher's manual. Well, you know, I'm quite sure we would not have uh, fulfilled our function if we had had that script in mind. And it may be helpful at times to realize this, that uh, by doing what I think is immediate and important for us to do, then we are led to the next step and the next step. And uh, you, all, you all know that, but uh, this is my, my personal experiences with that. Uh, I'll try to stop in just a moment, but uh, one of the, the problems I had is that uh, this is all a different language. And as I started to type this, I typed the material because Helen couldn't, she could take it down in shorthand, and she could also type, but she couldn't bring them together. That was getting too close to it. So if she took it down in shorthand and read it to me, that was about uh, as close as we could come to, to doing this, but she was afraid to even read it to me. She was always, always afraid it was going to goof, you know. Or, and she said, if it makes one grammatical mistake, I've had it. <laughs> we, were, we were not uh, necessarily grateful in the sense that I think we might have been, but uh, certainly much more threatened by all this. And then I found that as I was typing from her dictation, fortunately, I have become a rather fast typist. And as Helen's boss, I thought it was only appropriate that I should do that secretarial. And uh, she, was, uh, she was listening to all this. And so I would uh, type this thing up with original and two carbons. So they didn't want to lose anything. But then I thought I was making very strange mistakes like uh, when salvation was mentioned, I found I reversed the letters and it came, down, came out slavation. <laughs> and uh, then uh, my spelling isn't too bad, but I, when we came to crucifixion, I noticed I spelled it F-I-C-T-I-O-N. Uh, or expressions such as you and your brother, somehow the R got lost in the first R, it was you and your bother. And, uh, so it's obviously done with, I would say, considerable conflict. That's the thing that amazes me as much as it may amaze you, I don't know, is that we did it. And it never really occurred to us not to finish. We felt that this was something that had to be fitted in while I was uh, uh, co-editor of the Journal of Abnormal Psychology and turning down manuscripts all the time because they're unscientific. <laughs> but perfectly aware that this was much more far out than the manuscripts uh, we were receiving for publication in that eminent APA publication. And I thought, well, the only thing to do is to have a conscious awareness that this has to be a part of your life in some way, but it's not going to interfere with your job because you were hired to do other things. And if I'm supposed to give a, you know, a lecture on psychodynamic theory or a seminar with students or whatever it was, I will do it that way, but I will try to change the way I look at it. And maybe in that way, it will be different.